Okay, so uh, now that I'm editing the video, I thought I would do a little intro. So first of all, I'd like to apologize for the sniffling in the video. I have allergy issues. It's it's gotten better, but it's still not 100%. So there you go. And um, it is now technically the 13th, which is, you know, the day after the my SRS anniversary on the 12th. But I did record the video on the 12th. So there you go. So, so yeah, uh, here's the, so yeah, on to the video. Okay. Hello everyone. Today is the third anniversary of my sex reassignment surgery. And I said that I was going to do a Q and a and all of that and talk about my surgery and how it's been three years later so so yeah so first I'm going to talk a bit about you know the surgery itself and some of the recovery stuff but I kind of want to focus more on like how it's been three years down the road and um, I am going to talk about sexuality stuff so this is going to get TMI and you know a bit explicit so just uh, just a heads up and then I asked some people on social media for questions. And so then I'm going to go and answer people's questions. And some of those questions may have already been, may have already been covered in the stuff that I'm going to talk about, but we'll go ahead and, you know, address that when that comes up. So, um, I got my surgery done, done through, uh, Kaiser Permanente in Northern California. Which, for those of you who are not familiar with Kaiser, it is an HMO, a health management organization. So they are a medical plan and they have like their own doctors and their own facilities. So for the most part, if you need any medical stuff done, it's done through them at their facilities and with their doctors. And now they do use some outside doctors for their sex reassignment surgery for Northern California, at least. Um, if I remember correctly, they use uh, Dr. Meltzer and Dr. Satterwhite as their outside doctors. But given the type of plan that I was on, I, I didn't have an option. My only option was to was uh, Dr. Ali Salim, which is their own guy. And if you decide to look that guy up, make sure you specify Kaiser, because there's like another Dr. Ali Salim who got in trouble for something, and no, it's not the same guy. So make sure that you sp specify, you know, Ali Salim Kaiser. And so, yeah, my surgery was done by him at the uh, Kaiser Hospital in San Francisco. And the way they do the approval for the surgeries, you they do this at their uh, trans clinic in uh, Oakland. That's where I went. They also have a trans clinic in uh, San Francisco, if I remember correctly. So I'm sure they do some there as well. And they do multiple approvals all on the same day. And you have to uh, meet up with a with a psychologist, a social worker, and Dr. Salim. And then they, you know, conf meet up together to, you know, and talk amongst themselves to see if you qualify. And the psychologist, of course, takes care of, you know, the mental health side of things and make sure that you're, you know, a good candidate for it from that standpoint. You know, which is, it's pretty, it's pretty common, you know, to require, you know, approval from a, from a mental health person to get, sex reassignment surgery historically it's generally been the requirement of two people one of whom had to be a psychologist in this case it was only one of them and then the um the social worker is there to ensure that you have a proper like aftercare situation and some people might want to label this as unnecessary gatekeeping but this surgery is no joke and you absolutely need somebody to help you after the surgery. You know, this is not something you can do on your own properly. And so I think it's perfectly fair 
you know, for them to want to ensure that people are going to have a proper situation, you know, to recover in. And then the uh, Dr. Salim is there just to make sure that you're a good candidate, medically speaking. And so, of course, you know, they approved me. And then there's some stuff you have to do before the surgery. Like, I had to lose some weight. And aside from the fact that surgeries are generally riskier on, on you know, people who are obese, one of the reasons specifically for losing weight in regards to this surgery is the type of surgery that I got is called um, penile inversion is the type of vaginoplasty that I got where they, you know, they take the skin of the penis and they turn it inside out and that's what makes the vagina. And the layer of fat on your crotch area, that will impact the depth of the vagina. So I had to lose enough weight so I didn't have too much fat in the crotch area that would negatively impact the uh, vaginal depth. And speaking of vaginal depth, I was actually offered the option of having a zero depth vaginoplasty where, you know, I basically wouldn't have a vagina, but I did opt for the, uh, the full deal. So yeah, I had to lose some weight, which I managed to do. And then you have to, you have to stop taking nicotine. I don't remember for how long, but um, nicotine is a vasoconstrictor, so it interferes with healing. So yeah, no nicotine. It's not just smoking. You can't even have no vaping, no nicotine gum, nothing. Also, you have to stop taking estrogen before the surgery. Initially, I was supposed to stop for a month, but I, I talked to Dr. Salim about it because I did not want to be going for a month off of estrogen. So he said I could just do it for two weeks. So that's what I did. And it kind of sucked because I ended up with like hot flashes. Yeah, not fun. And then a couple of days before the surgery, you do a, a bowel cleanse. And so that entails, um, what that entails is a, um, doing a, a liquid diet where, you know, you're limited to things like water, coffee without anything in it, um, Gatorade, clear juices like apple juice, you know, like broth and jello. And so because I'm a vegan, that meant no jello. So I basically ended up living off of, you know, what was it like water, Gatorade, uh, black coffee, some uh, vegan beef broth. It was like a th I don't remember what brand it was, but it was like the kind that's like powdered. And so just a little bit of that in some hot water. And an apple juice. And then you also drink this stuff called Gavalite, which is a bowel cleanser. Yeah, that stuff is not pleasant. It's got a kind of a funky flavor and the texture is weird. But you have this like big ass, like I think it's like a gallon sized jug of the stuff that you have to end up drinking. And so you just drink a glass of it at a time and, and it makes you shit out everything in your bowels. And the reason for doing the bowel cleanse is because of the area that they're working in, you know, on the on the off chance that they perforate into your um, into your bowels, they don't want to have any like bacteria, you know, causing any problems. So, got to clean out the bowels. That was fun. And so then. And if I remember correctly, I had to stop like completely consuming anything. Like it was like a, a certain amount of time before the surgery. And this is something that is very standard. They always tell you that you're not allowed to have anything to eat or drink a certain amount of hours before the surgery. And the reason they do that is so you is that because of the risk of aspiration, if you have anything in your stomach, when they go to intubate you after they've you know administered the anesthesia, there is the risk that you know the the contents of your stomach can come up and get into your airway, and so that's bad. 
So yeah, when you're going to get a surgery and they tell you not to eat or drink anything for however many hours beforehand, absolutely pay attention to that. It is to keep you from being dead. Anyway, so my my mom and dad uh, took me to the hospital in San Francisco, which was really, really awesome of that. Because at one point, when I first came out as trans, my mom was totally not accepting. So... Going from that to, like, being the one to give me a ride to the surgery, that's that's pretty cool. So we had to get there at uh, 6 in the morning. So we had to be up at the ass crack in the morning for that. And let's see. And, um, oh, one of the things they, they do there at the uh, hospital in San Francisco that's kind of cool is they have a board that shows, like, the, the status of the, of the patients. But what they do for privacy is each patient is given a number. And so my parents were given that number. So rather than going up to the lady at the desk every however often and going and wanting to have an update, they can just look up on the board and they can see, you know, what the deal is. And because the um, cell phone service was kind of crap inside the hospital, they gave my parents a little device that they could use to, to communicate with them. So yeah, and oh, for the surgery, they, they made me take out all of my all of my piercings. And I had been under the impression that it was just um, an issue with metal, but no, they make you take out absolutely everything. I, I had gotten some non-metallic jewelry to put in, but I still had to take out everything. And I had gotten my septum pierced like not too long before that. Thankfully, everything was healed up enough that um, my septum didn't close up. So that was good. But just keep that in mind. If you're, I think this applies to any surgery, you know. So if you're going to get a surgery, like don't get any new piercings um, before that because they will make you take them all out. So... So, yeah, I got to take out all my piercings and, you know, get the little gown on and everything. And so then, you know, the fun part comes when they do the IV, um, also known as a cannula in other countries. Um, yeah, I, I hate getting those put in. And so the first, you know, nurse was doing it on my on my right arm and like did it like three times and kept fucking it up. And so they had to get another nurse to be the one to do it. And so that guy did it on my left arm and it finally took. Yeah, not fun getting poked that many times. And then um, the, the, uh, the anesthesiologist came to say hi. And I had initially gotten a message from the anesthesiologist through Kaiser's online messaging system and then that anesthesiologist had come by to say, hey, I'm not going to be your anesthesiologist. So the other guy who was my anesthesiologist came, came to say hi. So then, you know, I'm wheeled off into surgery. And the thing I hate about surgeries is I just, I'm, I hate, I don't like the anesthesia. Like I had my gallbladder taken out not too long ago and it still like worried me, even though I know it's not that dangerous and everything but but yeah my my surgery took uh it took eight hours oh okay hold on hold on i need to back up because i completely forgot about something which i hope this isn't too disjointed but yeah one of the things i had to do before the surgery that i completely blanked on about is you have to do some uh, hair removal downstairs. Um, I did some genital electrolysis because you have to do permanent hair removal of some of your pubic hair, like on the uh, shaft of the penis and around the base of the penis. And I don't recall if they had to do the how much how much they actually had to do, but the reason for doing the permanent hair removal is so you don't end up with hair inside your vagina. And for those of you not familiar with electrolysis, the way it works is they stick a little uh, probe down into the uh, hair follicle and run an electric current and, you know, zap the hair follicle. 
And as you can probably imagine, that's not fun. I mean, I did have numbing cream, but even with the numbing cream, it still hurt. But I will say that I think facial electrolysis is worse because at least with genital electrolysis, I could like stare at my phone and like go on social media or whatever while it was getting done. So yeah, completely spaced on the genital electrolysis, but yeah. Yeah, you got to do that. I had to do that for like six, once a week for six months before my surgery. So yeah, back to the surgery. Like I was saying, the, um, the surgery took eight hours and I was under for like 10. So yeah, that's... So yeah, it's, it's, it, that surgery is absolutely no joke. And the surgery, like I said, was done by Dr. Ali Salim and he was assisted by a urologist, Dr. Thomas. And then, of course, all the various ancillary, you know, people involved in surgeries, the anesthesiologist and whomever else. And I had to stay in the hospital for seven days, you know, and initially, you know, there's like packing inside of the vagina and I've got, you know, a catheter put in and a couple of drains. And and when you... And when they do the surgery, they, they, when they put these like things on your legs that inflate to help, you know, maintain like circulation in your legs. So I had those on initially. And then it was after like, I don't remember how many days, but after like a couple of days or something, they actually made me get up and walk, which, you know, not the easiest thing to do after you've had your, um, your genitalia rearranged, but it's, uh, it's a good thing that they do that, you know. It helps, you know, get the blood flowing and everything. And um, in the hospital, they had me for pain management. They had me on a pain pump with Dilaudid, which is uh, hydromorphone. And pain pumps are cool because you have a button that you push and it drops a, a hit of the medication into your IV. And it's set up to limit how much, you know, how many hits you can get within a specified period of time so you can't overdose. And every time you push the button, it records that. And so, and even if you've already gotten your allotment of pain medication, it still records when you push the button. So that way, when the nurse comes to check, they can see, oh, you've hit your pain button a whole bunch. So maybe we need to adjust your dose of medication. So that was cool. And one of the things with, with pain meds is what you need to do is you need to take your hit before the pain comes on. So that way the pain medication will keep the pain from happening, you know, altogether. And then before I left, they switched me to oral oxycodone and then they sent me home with a bunch of that. And one of the questions I actually got was about how painful it was. And honestly, I don't really remember the pain being that bad, but they gave me some pretty heavy duty pain meds. I mean, given the kind of pain meds that they were giving me, that says a lot about the pain. It was probably, probably would have been really, really bad without that. Uh, let's see what else about the hospital stay. Oh yeah, so my my birthday is uh, tomorrow, the 13th. So I got to spend my birthday in the hospital. And there was one, one year for my birthday, I had this vegan chocolate cake from um, Whole Foods. And they had mini versions of that cake. And so my mom, you know, brought me mini chocolate cake for my birthday. Mini vegan chocolate cake from Whole Foods. So that was that was really nice. Oh, another thing, pro tip. If you're going to stay in the hospital for, for a little while, like bring some like granola bars or protein bars or whatever. Because hospital food is not the best. They did have vegan options, thankfully, but they all kind of sucked. And so I had brought some uh, Cliff Builders bars and some Nugo Dark bars. So I had stuff to eat that wasn't hospital food. Honestly, the best thing was breakfast, which was like a bagel with vegan butter and like coffee with soy milk and, and sugar. And I think there was some cereal maybe. I can't remember. Um, that was definitely the best. The, the rest of it was kind of crap. But anyway... So yeah, spent seven days in the hospital, and then before before you leave, nurse comes and takes out the packing out of the vagina, 
And um, that was, it made me, it reminded me of like that magician's trick where they pull out that continuous scarf. Because the guy just kept pulling, pulling out packing. Just, it was like never ending just about. And then before leaving the hospital, you have to start dilating. And, um, okay. So yeah, they give you dilators. These, hold on. This is what they look like. They're, they're essentially like, like hard, hard plastic dildos. I guess they're plastic. And they come in, these ones are designed specifically for sex reassignment surgery. So I've got this, the, the smallest one is this purple one. And then the next size up is this blue one. And then the green one. And then the orange one. So they gave me this set of four and then I started dilating with this purple one. And it's got these little dots on it so you can get keep track of like your depth. And so, now I've actually been pretty bad about dilating. Initially I was really good about keeping up with the dilating but I haven't been as good so my vagina is actually really tight, much tighter than it should be because, because I've been slacking off on using these. But honestly, it doesn't bother me that much because I, I don't really care for penetration that much and so it's not really that necessary but I do I do think I do I probably want to get back into a proper dilation routine because maybe I would enjoy penetration more if my vagina were properly dilated but yeah they I had to start dilating while I was in the hospital and then you know, initially you're supposed to dilate, I think it was like four times a day. And then, you know, you work your way up through the dilators. And if you dilate like you're supposed to, eventually you'll be able to go without dilating for quite some time. But, but of course, like I said, I've, I've, I am very bad about dilating. So, so yeah, then after seven days I get to go home and, um, pro tip um what for sitting down it's going to be painful so you the, the, so what you want to do is get one of those like neck pillows that has like the kind of the u shape and make sure you get one that's sufficiently sturdy and not too squishy and that definitely works better than that's going to work better than like one of those inflatable donuts for hemorrhoids or whatever because you you know you have the opening towards the front and so I had to sit on that for, for quite some time. And I ended up spending just a lot of time in bed at home, you know, watching TV and whatever. And, you know, I don't actually remember how long the, how long the recovery was. Because, you know, for, to be completely 100% healed, that takes, um, that takes a full year for the swelling to go down completely. But it's definitely like it's definitely much quicker than that to be able to get back to basically back to normal. It's just a few weeks or something, but I don't quite remember what it was. And then initially, you you have to wear a maxi pad twenty four seven, and so I ended up opting for um, um, cloth pads, which I'm really glad I did because it was so nice to just be able to throw them into the washing machine. Oh, let's see. Okay, so now I want to talk a bit about the uh, sexuality stuff and sensitivity and all that kind of good shit. So my situation, I think, is a little bit unusual. I started masturbating, I think it was like 10 days or something, 10, 11 days after my surgery. Or I something like that. It was... It was surprisingly fast. And so I was just really horny and, and, you know, and I started just using, you know, just um, external manual masturbation. And I was about to have an orgasm, but I stopped myself because I'm thinking, wait a minute, am I supposed to be doing this? Because I wasn't sure if it was safe for me to do that. So I ended up messaging my doctor and explained, you know, hey, this is what I was doing. Is it okay if I do that? And, um... Yeah, and he said that was fine, that external stimulation is fine. 
you cannot do any kind of penetrative stuff, any penetrative sex of any sort, um, for the first six months. And I would, and personally, I would suggest not doing, not using any sex toys of any sort for the first six months. And just sticking to, you know, just using your hands. Now, as far as I know, like, getting, you know, getting things going, like, as quickly as I did, that's unusual. So, yeah, if you're getting the surgery done, like, don't feel like, like, there's something wrong with you if you're not, you know, masturbating, you know, like, right quick like I did. You know, I I masturbated a lot. Before, you know, before I had my surgery, I was masturbating pretty much every day. So, so I think that helped me get back into the swing of things. And, and yeah, my sensitivity is great. My... My, my clitoris is not just for show. It is, in fact, fully functional. Um, what used to be the head of my penis is what they made my clitoris out of. And they just have all the nerves and blood vessels intact, and they just reshape it into a clitoris and stick it in the right spot. So that's pretty cool. And like I mentioned before, the, uh, the vagina is made out of what used to be the shaft of my penis. So they just slit, slit the penis open, they remove all the unnecessary tissue, and they turn it inside out. And the, uh, the base of my vagina is made from a piece of the scrotum. And I'm not sure what my labia are made out of. And my, my labia, I don't really have a super well-defined like labia majora and labia minora. It's more like one set of labia with some folds in it. And I do have a minor issue on my left labia because I had a, um, a suture that popped out prematurely. But it's really only a minor cosmetic issue, so I never bothered to get it fixed, because it's just not a big deal. Because otherwise, you know, everything everything works fine. I, I healed up great. I've had no issues. And, you know, I, um, I masturbate on a pretty regular basis. And... You know, one of the one of the questions I think somebody was asking was like, "What what does it feel like to come?" And so, what's interesting is if I'm stimulated in the right way, I ejaculate. And so, um, I still have a prostate, and my vagina is actually located between my prostate and rectum. And so, as far as I can tell, the stuff that comes out is just the fluid from the prostate. So it's the same fluid that comes out, that came out before, the only difference is that since I don't have testicles, there's no sperm. But, you know, but it's the same, but it's the same fluid. And, and as far as like what it feels like, um, I, in some respects, I guess it feels very similar to the way it used to, because it's, it's the same equipment basically just rearranged, but it definitely feels better. Masturbation is a hell of a lot more enjoyable these days than, than it was when I had a penis. Absolutely. You know, and it's funny, you know, I've had like TERFs, you know, on, on Twitter and wherever argue that, that I'm going to end up regretting the surgery. And it's not uncommon for me, like, after I masturbate and have a really good orgasm, for me to just think to myself, you know... So when exactly am I supposed to start regretting this? Because, yeah, like, I, I absolutely, you know, enjoy masturbating a hell of a lot more than I used to. And I know that there are going to be some of these turfy, gender-critical type of people who are probably going to want to accuse me of having autogynephilia because, you know, because of the fact that I enjoy masturbating. But you know what? That, that has nothing to do with why I got the surgery. You know, like, if I, if I were not able to have another orgasm, I would still be glad I got the surgery. So, you know, orgasms are just icing on the cake. And so, yeah, aside from the fact that I don't dilate like I should, so my vagina is extra tight, 
Um, everything is actually healed up. Everything has gone really well, and I've been super happy with the results. And, oh, yeah, one of the things that's not uncommon with surgeries of this caliber is, like, right after you get the surgery to have this thought of, like, oh, my God, what the fuck did I just get myself into? But I never thought that. Like, that, that thought just never crossed my mind. And, like, within, like, a day or two of having the surgery, I was already forgetting what it was like to have a penis. So, yeah, I took to the surgery super quick. It was, it was, it was definitely impressive. So, let's see here. Let me, all right, let me go look at some of these uh, questions here. First, I'm going to look at the ones from Instagram. Let me see here. Ah, okay. Question, and these are all, these are all going to be anonymous. What's it feel like to have a, have a penis one day have a penis and the next have a vagina assuming it takes less than a day sorry if this is phrased incorrectly slash insensitively i wasn't sure how to phrase it and then they they go on to clarify by this i mean uh, by this i'm mostly talking about emotionally and mentally but also physically (laughs) yeah like i said for me like i took to it really quick so you know it's like it's like my brain you know, was expecting there to be a vagina, but there wasn't. There was a penis instead. And so once I got the right set of equipment, my brain just just took to it. So, yeah, it wasn't anything weird. Now, I imagine for somebody who, say, isn't trans, if they were to get a surgery like this, yeah, I'd probably fuck with their head really bad. And as far as, like, physically, again, you know... I, I took to it really well. Like one of the things I was expecting is that is that there would be times when I would do something expecting there to be a penis and then going, oops, that's right, I don't have one of those anymore. But that didn't happen. So So yeah, it was just it was great. Let's see here. Oh, uh, what's another question? Uh Ah, what's your opinion on getting prescribed painkillers after? Uh, Painkillers are absolutely necessary. Like I, you know, like I mentioned getting, you know, being on Dilaudid at the hospital and then being switched to oxycodone. I can't even begin to imagine how bad the pain would have been without the oxycodone. So yeah, painkillers are an absolute necessity. And if you're the kind of person that can't handle opiates, then, you know, honestly, getting the surgery would probably be a really bad idea unless you have, like, an insane pain tolerance because this this is no joke. Let me see. Uh, another question. How did you feel immediately after the surgery? You know, I mean, like, I was, of course, like just recovering from the anesthesia so that makes you feel a bit out of it but yeah i felt i felt pretty good aside from you know like i said having to recover from the anesthesia and everything and yeah like i said i didn't i never once thought oh shit what have i gotten myself into so yeah it was great you know aside from the usual you know just aches and pains and all of that And, oh, yeah, this person asked, what does it feel like to come? I already talked about that. Now, this person, did they they put you asleep when you did it? Yes. Of course. That would be insane to do a surgery like that on just, like, local anesthetic. No, yeah, they, they absolutely give you general anesthetic and put you right out for that surgery. Okay, another question. Do you miss your pee-pee? Not in the least bit at all, ever. You know, I have absolutely zero regrets about having gotten the surgery. <laughs> another question. Can you feel see that? Can you still feel stimulation? Absolutely. I love it. Another question. Is it true tranny vagina is lubricated with doo-doo? Now, that question might seem a little silly, but... It's not entirely silly 
because there is actually a, a, a form of the surgery where part of the vagina is made with a piece from your colon, which is a mucous membrane. And so that allows your vagina to lubricate. But the downsides that I've heard of is one, you're wet all the time. So it's not just, you know, getting wet when you're, when you're aroused. And second of all, because it does use a piece on your colon, apparently for some period of time, you know, well, your vagina literally smells like shit. So it takes some period of time for the smell to go away. But I did not have that procedure. So if I'm sticking anything in my vagina, I have to use lube because I do not self lubricate. All right, let's see. Yeah, another question, which is a ridiculous question, but I'll read it off anyway. Did it hurt when they lopped off your transbian femcock? Yeah, that's not how it works. It irritates me when people talk about getting your dick chopped off, because that's not what they do. All right, now let's look at some questions from Twitter. Okay, question. Um, how painful was it? Um... I don't remember the pain being that bad, but I also had some really super heavy duty pain meds, so that helped. And another one, how difficult was urination? I haven't had any issues with that. Um, honestly, the only issues I've had in the urination department is just some urinary tract infections, really, but, but yeah, I have no problems urinating. Let's see. Next question, did it help you feel good in your skin? Like, do you feel complete or at least better than you were feeling? Did it take time to find a doctor you trusted? While I heard horror stories of doctors being assholes to sex reassignment patients, unsure of, of on the process of finding one. Okay, um, yes, my dysphoria has gotten a whole lot better. My dysphoria is not completely gone, but it's gotten so much better. Yeah, I definitely feel loads better. In fact, I didn't realize just how bad my dysphoria was until um, until I got the... I didn't realize how bad my genital dysphoria was until I had the surgery. So, yeah. And as far as finding a doctor, like, I... Since my insurance... Since my insurance covered it and I was going through... You know, I really had no choice in the doctor. I, Dr. Salim was my only option, but yeah, Dr. Salim was great. And he did a great job and his bedside manner was wonderful and everything. So I have absolutely no complaints whatsoever. And if you're in Northern California and you know, you get on Kaiser, like I can totally recommend Dr. Salim. So yeah, go for it. And honestly, like Southern California Kaiser covers this kind of stuff too. Like Kaiser has amazing trans benefits. So if you're in California and you're trans and you want hormones or hair removal or surgeries, you know, whatever, like get on Kaiser because they cover all of that shit. Seriously, they cover hormones, hair removal, Sex reassignment surgery, facial surgery, top surgery for trans men, breast implants for trans women. Like, it's amazing what they'll cover. So, yeah, go for it. Let's see. Okay, somebody asked, did you get a tunicle graft? And so I, I wasn't sure what that was, so I asked them what it was, and it says... And this person said, so my surgeon's technique, to my understanding, is that it's a penile inversion with a graft to scrotal tunica to increase depth and add lubrication. You know, I don't know if that's what I had done. I do know that, that some scrotum was used for the base of my vagina. But other than that, I don't know. So that is it for the questions that I got asked on social media. I didn't get as many questions as I would have liked. But... And, but yeah, this video is already getting a little long, so I think what I'm going to do is, let me see if, let me check my notes real quick and see if by chance I missed anything. Um, I think I pretty much covered everything, but yeah, I'm, 
I mean, overall, like, I am super glad I got the surgery. And, you know, like, my, my, the, my vulva looks great. Like, you know, I don't, you know, I don't know how, how, I imagine that maybe like a, um, like a gynecologist might be able to tell that it's surgically constructed, but, but like if I took my clothes off in a women's locker room, nobody would be able to tell. I mean, you know, you'd probably have to like look up close and personal to be able to tell. And even then, even then you might not be able to tell. And regardless, I'm, I'm happy with it. And I get, you know, I get really great sensation and, oh yeah, some things that I really like, just some sort of side benefits is that it's easier to cross my legs now that I don't have, you know, a cock and balls in the way, so that's nice. And I just, I like not having the bulge in my pants, having to worry about that and just in general, it's really nice. I like not having to take testosterone blockers anymore because... That was annoying. And so, yeah, overall, I'm just super happy. I'm super duper happy with the surgery. And and I'm really glad that I got it done. And everything is great three years down the road. So I think I will, I will stop here because, like I said, it is getting a bit long. And so I will see you on the next one.